Well, friends, thank you for coming together to worship our risen Lord Jesus Christ this morning. You know, one of the reasons that we should celebrate today, this sixth Sunday of Easter, is because God has been faithful to us. God has faithfully provided for our needs during this pandemic, and God is making a way forward for us, not just a way forward for us to to gather together again as a community, but a way forward in this world to serve him fully. We trust that the Spirit of God continues to be hard at work among and within us, building us up brick by brick through the provision of God's Word. And once again, we say thanks be to God for that. You know, in this season, our eyes so easily focus on other things, important things, stuff like, you know, when we're going to be able to gather again or how we're going to be able to continue ministering in a world that is rightfully observing physical distancing measures or or even how our nation is going to recover from the many burdens that we've faced and will continue to face. But each week, as we've been tracking in the first epistle of Peter, the Spirit has reminded us of the ways that the resurrection is being worked out in our lives today, in these days. And now the Word of God is going to challenge us to surrender even more fully to God in this season. You know, each week we've remembered the context of First Peter explicitly aloud. The, the context was that of a young, diverse, and expanding church that was facing social mistreatment and exclusion because of their decision to follow Jesus. It wouldn't be surprising if many of those believers had become disillusioned in their faith because of how their lives had just been turned upside down. You know, our world can seem like that today, upside down. And if that's caused any of you great pain or or hurt this morning, if you're hurting today, I just want you to know that I am so, so sorry. You know, I I don't have much when it comes to words of consolation or, or even inspiration. But in the spirit of God's church, what I do have, I give to you now. I invite you to hear the word of the Lord from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 to 22. And once again, this comes from Pastor Alex's contextual translation that I've worked on all week. Hear the word of the Lord. Now, who would dare mistreat you if y'all became known for passionate, radical devotion and goodness? Still, even if, Y'all do suffer for righteous behavior. You are blessed. Don't be afraid of them. Don't be terrified. Rather, sanctify Christ the Lord in your hearts. Whenever anyone asks you to explain the hope that is in you, always have an answer ready. But answer with humility and respect, keeping a sound mindfulness of God's will. This way, whenever y'all are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be the ones who are shamed. And if the will of God wishes this for y'all, well, then it's much better to suffer for doing what is right than to do evil and suffer later. For Christ also suffered once on account of sins, the righteous one for the unrighteous, so that he might lead y'all to God. Christ was put to death by humans, but made alive by the Spirit. At that moment of the Spirit's raising, he went and proclaimed to those spirits in prison. These spirits had been disobedient in the past, in the days of Noah, when God patiently waited during the building of the ark, in which few lives, eight to be exact, were saved through the water. That flood anticipated the baptism which now saves you, not by washing filth from your bodies, but by pledging to God that y'all will keep your eyes fixed on him through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers subject to him. This is the word of the Lord. 
we say thanks be to God. Amen. You know, when I was in college, uh, both at uh, the larger Kansas State University and the smaller Mid-America Nazarene University, it was customary to walk into a classroom or a lecture hall on the first day and sit down and hear faintly all around you, even from across the space, hey, is this anthropology? Hey, is this, uh, is this geography? Hey, is, uh, is this my New Testament class? Hey, is this Christian beliefs? And eventually, the professor of the class would stand before everybody and after greeting us would say, hello, if you are here for anthropology or if you're here for geography or if you're here for introduction to New Testament or if you're here for Christian beliefs, well, you're in the right place. And at this point, many of us would look around just real briefly and, and hopefully catch somebody who was leaving the room because they were not in the right place. Place. It was the simple graces of being in college to see other people suffer rather harmless bits of misfortune for our own amusement. Now, hopefully, none of you have ever found yourselves in that kind of situation, although if you have, I would really like to hear about it because, again, it makes me feel happy. But regardless of whether you have been in the wrong place before, it's a common anxiety that most of us have. I mean, nobody wants to show up to a party or a wedding or a funeral or even a, a conference or an event at the wrong place, at the wrong venue. Nobody wants to be at the wrong place. You know, there's a challenge that followers of Jesus regularly have to deal with, and it comes in the form of that very anxious first day of class question, am I in the right place? It's a question that we ask ourselves and that, that other people might ask of us for very good and for very bad reasons. You know, sometimes, am I in the right place is meant to mean, you know, am I growing in faith or am I becoming who God wants me to be? Other times, am I in the right place may just be another way of asking, you know, when I did or said that thing or those words earlier, was my heart in the right place? Or, or did, I, did I do it or did I say it for the right reasons? You know, maybe in a more negative sense, am I in the right place can mean, am I sure that I'm really doing the right thing? Or am I really going in the right direction? Because, you know, I, I'm not seeing the results. I'm not seeing the, the, the numbers, the statistics, the results that I, I should be seeing or that I think I should be seeing. You know, truth be told, I'm not much of a fan of that question, am I in the right place? It can be rather vicious, rather graceless. It's a question that we've convinced ourselves is right to ask, despite the fact that we tend to ask it for, well, all the wrong reasons. I mean, did you notice that in each one of those situations I just mentioned a moment ago, uh, each one of those, the concern was always for the immediate perceivable results. You know, if I can't always and immediately measure whether or not I'm growing in faith or becoming who God wants me to be or doing what God wants me to do or going in the direction that God wants me to go in or seeing the results that I believe I should be seeing when it comes to all of those questions, well, then I, I must not be in the right place spiritually. Look, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that results don't matter. I'm simply pointing out that following Jesus is a much, much messier and complicated task than we've allowed for. As somebody who faces the temptation regularly of asking, am I, am I doing the right thing? Am I in the right place? Am, am I following God the right way? Even as a pastor, am I following how God is leading me in the right ways? I, I thank God that I'm not a farmer because I would absolutely lose my mind waiting for the harvest to come, waiting for those results that I've convinced myself in my mind that I should be seeing all the time, waiting for those things to come to pass. The truth is, friends, that faith grows best with slow and intentional care, and it 
Well, it often can only be measured in centimeters and inches, not in feet and miles. The fact of the matter is that faith and life often come together like a, like a muddy dog pile. And sometimes, <laughs> all right, many times, we feel like we're at the bottom of it. The believers who made up First Peter's audience probably felt this way, like they were at the bottom of a dog pile. They were probably asking themselves, hey, are we in the right place? Are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? Because, well, things, things aren't looking good. And First Peter is well aware of their situation. He's aware of their challenges and their temptations. And yet he doesn't respond by saying, are, are you in the right place? Come on, guys. You know you're in the right place with God. Your, your suffering has nothing to do with whether you've made the right decision in following Jesus. Rather than do that, he, he points to the resurrection of Jesus as the overwhelming evidence that they are exactly in the right place. They're exactly where God wants them to be. If we followed First Peter's line of thinking from chapter 2 to our, our present place in chapter 3, we might summarize it all in this way. You know, believers uh, are, are chosen and precious in God's eyes because Jesus is chosen and precious. Because Jesus was raised and is the foundation of God's redemptive work in the world, well, then, then we too are chosen and precious. So make sure that your behavior is Christ-like and honorable. You, you don't need to be afraid to suffer and to make sacrifices for your faith. In fact, when you do suffer and when you do make sacrifices, you're actually like Jesus. You actually have God's approval. But we get the impression in 1 Peter 3, verses 13 to 17, that there's, there might be some concern that the believers are not won over by this argument, that, that suffering is good. I doubt many of us would be won over by that argument, that suffering is good. So instead, Peter takes another tack in, in verses 13 to 17, and we might summarize his message here in, in this way. Church, you're in the right place if you're at the center of God's will. First Peter is hopeful that the believer's radical Christ-like devotion and goodness amongst their neighbors will be enough to ward off hostilities. Because after all, if somebody gifts you a pie, you don't criticize them because you don't like the tray that it came on. Otherwise, you're just a, pie or a jerk with a pie. You might be a pie with a jerk. They don't need to, to fret about suffering because First Peter seems to think that it's quite possible that their good behavior will be enough to convince their neighbors to not bring suffering into their lives. But he goes on to say that even if they do have to suffer because of some jerks, they can consider themselves blessed. He says that in verse 14. Rather than be afraid of facing mistreatment, they can find peace and comfort at the center of God's will. Now, you may wonder exactly what is the center of God's will for your life or even for, for our life as a, as a church? We have a tendency to think that it's, it's some hyper-specific calling, uh, you know, that in the same way that I've, I've been called to be not just a pastor here, but a, a pastor in general, so too is everybody called to something super specific. I'm called to be an evangelist. I'm called to be a, a prayer warrior. I'm called to be this or that. And, and sometimes that's true. But remember that First Peter is describing the center of God's will for a very broad group of believers who are spread throughout dozens of churches in Asia Minor. Perhaps the center of God's will is much wider than we might think, at least here. So, so what must we do to be at that center? Well, we see in verses 15 to 16 that, that we should, one, sanctify Christ the Lord in our hearts, and two, always be ready to testify of our hope and to do so in ways that are humble and respectful to those who hear it. Man, that, 
that last part is so important, and that's why Peter brings it out for us. It's important that we testify in ways that are not just humble, in ways that are not arrogant or not proud or not conceited, but also respectful, respectful of the people that we're speaking to. You know, that phrase, sanctify Christ the Lord in your hearts, probably sounds a little strange to you. In, in, in all honesty, it, it kind of is. I mean, how do you sanctify Jesus? How do you make Jesus more holy? He's Jesus. He's the Christ. He's the Son of God. How do you, a person, make him, the God person, more holy? But really, what, what it's doing is making a profound claim. You see, the ancients saw the heart as the place where, where people ultimately determine how they're going to live and act in this world. So when First Peter encourages the believers to sanctify Christ the Lord in your hearts, he's telling them to commit themselves entirely to Jesus, to be holy as Jesus is holy, and to make that commitment evident to the world through how they choose to live. And one of the best ways that they can show their commitment is by giving the world an incredible grace, the gift of their testimony. Testimony has power and grace in it. In all honesty, the world needs less diatribes from Christians against other people or, or issues or cultures that we might disagree with or that we might find ourselves opposed to. It needs more Christians simply sharing how God has loved them. For the world is blessed when God's people share with humility and respect their stories of what God has done in their lives. And it's also how we can know and have assurance that we are at the center of God's will if we are seeking and becoming like Jesus and sharing his love. Now, none of us are called, or sorry, all of us, excuse me, all of us are called to be at the center of God's will, but, but that doesn't mean that we should be static or inactive, because while we may not be called to, to be like international missionaries who travel all around the world to, to share the hope of Jesus, we are nevertheless called to be on the move. In fact, First Peter emphasizes to his audience that Jesus was on the move the very moment that the Spirit raised him on Easter Sunday. And to help make this point in verses 19 to 20, First Peter retells a story from the book of Enoch. It's an ancient Hebrew apocalyptic text that was well known by the early Christians of Jesus's well, after Jesus and, and in the time of the New Testament. In fact, both First and Second Peter allude to this work, and, and Jude verses 14 to 15 actually quote from it. So perhaps early Christians were familiar with it in, in the same way that we're familiar with legends and folklore that are, that are common in American culture. Uh, you know, take, for instance, the, the legend and folklore associated with John Chapman, if you don't know who John Chapman is, you actually do. That's Johnny Appleseed. Perhaps uh, we might associate with Johnny Appleseed in the same way that these folks associated with the Book of Enoch. We, we know about the legends and the folklore behind it. Now, the Book of Enoch recounts the apocalyptic adventures of Enoch. You might remember Enoch. He's Found in, in Genesis chapter 5, he's actually Noah's great-grandfather who, according to f chapter 5, verse 4 of Genesis, didn't die, but was actually taken up to heaven by God. In, in one of the stories from the book of Enoch, God actually sends Enoch to a, a secret prison, which is hidden somewhere beyond human reach. And, and this prison holds the fallen angels who had disobeyed God during the, the days of Noah the, the, the same fallen angels, it says, that were responsible for the wicked condition of the world before the flood, the very reason why God had to cleanse the world of its wickedness. And Enoch is sent to proclaim the doom of God's judgment against these angelic prisoners. He is not a messenger of mercy. He is a messenger of doom. Now, First Peter retells this story, but he he changes some things 
here and there. Uh, obviously, he replaces Enoch with Jesus in this retelling, but the big question is why? Why does First Peter insist on retelling this really strange story, a story that most of us probably haven't ever heard before? Why does he replace Enoch with Jesus? And, and why does First Peter think that any of this is relevant to the believers in his letter? Well, before we can try to answer that, I, I just want you to notice something subtle in the text, in the retelling of this story. You see, it says, after Jesus was raised by the Holy Spirit, he went to that prison, and, and, and they know which prison he's talking about, uh, the, the readers of First Peter. They know which prison he's talking about. And it says that Jesus proclaimed to the spirits imprisoned there. But what did Jesus proclaim? Was it, was it judgment like an Enoch story? Was it something else? Well, it, it doesn't seem to be the case that it was judgment. The text doesn't say that it was judgment. And, and when the Bible talks about judgment, it makes it pretty clear that it's judgment. And here, we don't get the sense that Jesus was proclaiming judgment to these spirits in prison and the, the retelling of this story. Rather, since all of this follows Jesus' resurrection, it is much more likely that First Peter is actually describing Jesus proclaiming the good news of his resurrection to imprisoned fallen angels. Whoa. What, what a crazy, crazy story, a crazy turn of events. Now, I don't want you to think that this is something that literally happened. It, it's probably not something that literally happened. It's more likely that First Peter was using this story, this well-known story, this Johnny Appleseed-type story from the book of Enoch to communicate a critically important truth, and it's a truth that's for us today, friends. Jesus is on the move, and you're in the right place if you are where Jesus is. I'm sure there were many in First Peter's audience who had suffered dearly for their faith, and now they were, they were struggling to see how there might be any redemptive purpose to it. God, how can there be redemption when I am suffering like this? How can this situation of suffering be where God wants me to be? Maybe you've asked that question before, or maybe, maybe you've even asked it recently. Perhaps First Peter is saying to them, hey, if Jesus is willing to go all the way to the spiritual big house in order to the reveal the good news of his resurrection, perhaps with the, the hope that the fallen angels, the prisoners there, would acknowledge him as their Lord and Savior. If he's willing to do all of that, don't you think he'll come to you where you're at? You see, Jesus is proclaiming resurrection in our world, and, and he's liberating it from the clutches of sin today what if we all woke up each and every day and the first thing that we said is jesus i don't know where you're planning on proclaiming and liberating today but you know what i'm right behind you and i don't care what i face in following following you i'm gonna be right behind you the road may be rocky i, I may i may get a, a a few thorns in my foot as i walk along the path that you're treading but I'm going to follow you. Not only would we be in the right place to see Jesus truly working in our midst, but I dare say that we would actually find healing and freedom from the ways that we actually remain imprisoned in our world. We would find, as we traveled from cell block to cell block with Jesus, that Jesus loves our enemies, those whom we think belong in those cells, those spiritual prisons. He loves them just as much as he loves us. We'd find, as we witnessed his mercy in the world, that we're not able any longer to tolerate injustice and indifference. These are the prisons that many of us need liberating from today. But even a jail cell is the right place to be if it's where Jesus is working and inviting us to work and serve alongside him. Because you see, if we keep our eyes fixed on him 
if we remain committed to following the example that Jesus has set for us, well, then we can trust that the resurrection will absolutely save us. His resurrection will absolutely save us. Next week, we're going to celebrate the ascension of Jesus. But in this passage, in 1 Peter chapter 3, we actually see a preview of that, specifically in verse 22. For Jesus is not simply our example of how to deal with mistreatment in our lives, nor is he simply the, the great liberator of all those who have been imprisoned by sin. Now, today, Jesus truly is Lord, the great king who sits upon the heavenly throne. And verse 22 invites us into his throne room so that we could acknowledge him as such today. And from the throne, our Lord looks at us and says to us, Oh, my beloved children, don't you worry. You're in the right place, right here with me, in my presence. You're in the right place. So stay a while. Look, don't you see how I rule over all creation? You see how I rule over everything that gives you fear? Don't be afraid. Don't be terrified. I'm here. I'm here on the seat of ruling, and I'm not going to let you down. I will teach you how to trust me more fully. I will show you how to see the world as I do and how to love all people as I do. And yes, even the ones who mistreat you. Take heart, because you are truly blessed. Friends, we don't have to be anxious today. We don't have to wonder if we're in the right place. We don't have to, to wonder if, if we're really following God the way that we need to. We can choose to see today the right place not as a certain set of results, but as an ever-growing commitment and obedience to God's will. We can choose to see today to not be anxious, to not get bent out of shape about where we're going, where we're, whatever, when we're talking about ourselves personally or even as a community of faith, where we're going, because wherever Jesus is leading us is the right place for us to be. We can choose to confess his lordship in our lives today, and we can trust it will be enough to carry us through the hard and difficult times. We can trust that it will bring us to the other side, looking more like Jesus than when we first began. And all God's people said to that, Amen.